District two. Present. District three. Present. District four. Present. District five. Present. District six. Present. District seven. Present. District eight. She's in the back. Mm -hmm. District nine. Here. District 10. Present. District 11. Present. District 12. Present. District 13. Here. District 14. And place 15. I'm here. Yeah, quorum, sir. Thank you very much, Ms. Pacina. Good morning. <laughs> Commissioners, today is Thursday, October 19th, 2023, 9 18 a.m. Welcome to the briefing of the Dallas City Plan Commission. Uh, as always, commissioners, this is just a time for questions uh, from commissioners to staff. We'll keep all our comments and uh, positions for briefing for the uh, hearing this afternoon, beginning at 1230. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to welcome uh, Commissioner Sleeper. Uh, welcome to you, sir. I think you're going to enjoy your time on the Planning Commission, and uh, you'll find this group that's very helpful. Uh, although I think the learning curve for you may not be as steep as, as it was for most of us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, commissioners, uh, we had changed things a little bit. Uh, looking forward, I think this docket and the next are going to be light, and then they're going to get very heavy after that. So uh, we're now moving the minor amendments to uh, briefing on request. So if anyone would like to have item number one brief, we can do that. If not, then we will keep moving. Would anybody want uh, like item number one briefed? Sir, I just uh, had a couple of questions for Miss Blue here. Uh, uh, this property was this property originally what was called Northtown Mall. Uh, sir, I'm not familiar. I know that originally they had the uh, maintenance shop. I don't know when it was built, um, but they're coming in and actually adding adding a phase two uh, to this property. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is the wrong project. I do apologize. <laughs> this is something that I staffed this morning. I'm sorry. Um, so I do not know the original uh, state uh, if it was a mall or not. That it, it does look like a mall. Um, but I did look at the earlier request just for uh, my project. Okay, thank you. And it, I noticed that there's a lot of construction going on over there. It's they're very busy uh, expanding their operations. So um, there seems like there's plenty of parking spaces uh, because it was a mall or something like that at one time. So. Yes, sir. And I also uh, looked at the parking count that's on the development plan and made sure that they're in compliance with what they said they have on site as far as uh -huh. And the question of the generators would run only during emergencies, power outages, things like that? Yes, sir. That's what the applicant uh, said in his uh, application. Okay. So that should not, I'm guessing, impact the, the neighborhood that's on the other, would be on the other side of the wall from the, the generators. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners, on this item? Okay, we'll keep moving to case number two. Mr. Pepe, good morning. Good morning. This is uh, Z212343. We're having some network issues, so I will have to have someone else display slides for us today. And it's taken one minute. <clears throat> hey, but the mics are very crisp today, I feel like, so. Ooh, no. <laughs> I don't think this is ready for, for music. It's too, too crisp. Thank you. 
So Z21234 is, next slide, an application for an MC1 multiple commercial district on property zoned as CR community retail district, an NSA neighborhood service district, and an MF2A multifamily district on the west corner of South Fitzhugh Avenue and Guysford Street. Next slide, please. It's about 13.6 acres. And it's located just east of Fair Park in Dallas. Next slide. Here's an aerial map of the site as it exists today. It is surface parking associated with the fair at this time, split between a couple different uh, zoning districts. And then um, we've got South Fitzhugh on the southeast side with the Fair Park neighborhood to the southeast. Next slide. So to the northeast, there's a couple warehouses. There's some surface parking, um, sort of catty corner across South Fitzhugh. Um, there's a couple parcels that are retail or undeveloped along Fitzhugh. There's more surface parking associated with the Fair Park to the southwest, more of that to the southwest, and more of that to the northwest, as well as the other parts of the fairgrounds. Next slide. So the area of request is currently zoned as CR Community Retail District, that NSA district, and an MF2, and it's developed with surface parking facility for Fair Park. The existing surface parking facility currently provides roughly 1,665 parking spaces. MC1 is a mul multiple commercial district that functions similarly to MU1 in terms of uses, but it doesn't include residential uses. The district will allow that necessary height to construct the proposed parking garage, whereas uh, other light commercial districts may not allow that uh, requested height of 56 feet. Next slide. So when we get down to the area, we're at Guysford on the northeast boundary of the property. Um, we kind of have turned off of South Fitzhugh going into Fair Park area. Next slide. Um, this is that also just the subject property itself. Next slide. And now looking looking south, I'm at the kind of the, the northmost part of this property. Uh, so we're almost in the fairgrounds by all means. Uh, next slide. And then that's what it looks like from the Fitzhugh approach. So we're looking northwest. Uh, there's a bit of a rise and then the fence and then the surface parking facility behind it. Next slide. And one of the current gates, um, which is from Fitzhugh, it's actually Lego Street. Um, I believe it becomes a, a sort of private drive associated with the um, with Fair Park at this point. That's why we've got gates there. Next slide. Another view, next slide. So when we get down to surrounding uses, this is across Guysford Street, warehouses on, on the right of Guysford Street when you're looking north, next slide. More warehouses, so next slide. More of that, next slide. And I think we've turned around, Pennsylvania is behind me in this, and then we're looking at the warehouses uh, further, next slide. And then, oh, it's actually, yeah, Coliseum Drive is kind of a city street inside a Fair Park property. So we're looking the northern reach of the, of the property for, that's up for zoning. And next slide. And then all the way down Coliseum, kind of right in the middle of the, where the surface parking becomes fairgrounds. Um, looking northwest, next slide. Obviously, these are taking a while back. <laughs> and we're looking across South Fitzhugh here. There's retail and some undeveloped parcels across Fitzhugh, next slide. And keep going down Fitzhugh, next slide. And retail at Fitzhugh and Lego, next slide. These were dark, this was a dark day, it looks like. Um, now I've, I've flipped around, that's uh, the fire station at Lego and, and Fitzhugh, next slide. Yeah, the same, similar view, looking south, next slide. So I put in development standards, um, it's split zone between three different zoning districts at this time, and, but they're requesting multiple commercial, which is a district you may not um, have seen before, uh, but there are 
several parcels throughout the city here and there that are MC1, and it kind of functions like an MU1 um, in both standards and uses, but it doesn't have that residential component. Um, so it allows for sort of a mix of commercial uses, but it does get us the height that they are requesting for the garage. Next slide. So staff recommendation is approval. Next slide, that's it. Thank you very much. Questions, <clears throat> Commissioner Wheeler. And do you know the reason that they're asking for a parking garage in um, at the prep park? Yes, so we've got our surface lot there. There's one big surface lot. There's another surface lot to the southwest, similar size and quantity of parking spaces. The one to the southwest, probably know the community park that's being planned there and constructed there. Um, that southwest lot is, is intended to become the park. This would free up um, some of the parking from that that's being removed, consolidated into a structure here. Uh, so they do need the height um, to build the, the garage in this case, uh, but it would allow them con to consolidate from other lots, especially the one to the southeast. Are they going to be, are, there will be, the front park will be losing some parking, but they will be making, um, will they be making, is that because they're going to have that part as the, the park that, I mean, the parking lots that there are now is going to become on that side a, the big park that the city is building, a uh, community park that's going to be outside the fair park grounds? Yes. So they, in, in Fair Park First presentations, they did, do state that it's a net reduction in parking because they're taking out two surface lots, two huge surface lots, consolidating into one garage, um, as well as half of this site, as you said, is going to be community park. Were you aware that they are going to make the top uh, deck of that parking garage uh, like an uh, observatory? Um, and it, it's going to make sure that they put some type of design factor so it blends in with the community? I, I am aware. Yes. Okay. And were any, there any community meetings surrounding this? I've been to a few, yes. And what was the consensus? Mixed. That's a tough question. <laughs> That's a tough Mixed, question. But there was community engagement, quite a bit of it. There was, there was a series of meetings, definitely. I'm, I'm sure people, it appeared, supported the park. Um, and the uh, Fair Park first presented this as a prerequisite or, or to a degree a, a necessary change to, to build the park because of the parking requirement, parking needs. Do you know that if Fair Park first is going to, were you, were, or do you know if they're going to present that presentation to show what it could look like? So it doesn't look like an eyesore? Or Present you know? to here? Do you know if they're going to? I'm they're not sure if, he's, if they're going to have their full presentation that they provided at the community meetings or, or not. Um, we'll figure we'll it out. See. I'll, I'll reach out and okay. see what they want to present. OK, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Hampton, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, following up on Commissioner Wheeler's question, Mr. Pepe, are you aware if this um, new structure has been presented to Landmark Commission yet? I'm not aware of that yet. Um, and so since it's within the Fair Park District, once the actual project moves forward, that would be a requirement as a part of the project. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Hall. Uh, height of 56 feet how many levels is that i'm not sure how many how many levels um it's they're not held to a certain amount of decks um but since this is a general zoning category we're not uh, we're not they're not held to decks or, or any amount but i'm not sure what that is but i can ask them okay are they going to go down as well would it be uh, sub-level parking or is it just uh, above above level my understanding as they said they, they can't uh, go down due to certain factors on the site, and so they won't. Okay, thank you. But they considered it. Any other questions on this item, commissioners? I have a quick question. Yes, Commissioner Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Pepe, do you know if there is a plan to have any landscape or retail at the first floor? of this parking garage in order to kind of enhance um, the current streetscape? 
Yes, well, they're going to be held to the Article 10 landscaping. Um, under this general zoning category, they have to do their um, base required landscaping, which includes um, a degree of buffering, um, site trees, and, and the like. Um, of course, part of the ground floor will be entrance to the community park, so I'd assume that there is some landscaping as well. Um, when I, I didn't hear if there was retail when they discussed it, but that is a, a technical possibility under the zoning. Thank you, Mr. Pepper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Wheeler, please. <laughs> Were you aware? I mean, were you aware that it's possibly not going to have retail because the retail will be a part of the park itself? This is up to be. Is this to be a part of the park that is going to be built as a city? I mean, at that at the front park, so they needed their parking requirement to accommodate that parking. Yes. So that so the retail is is actually supposed to be with on the actual fair grounds, a part of that park instead of being separate. That's what they've stated, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we'll keep moving. Thank I you very much, Mr. Pepe. Yes, please. Uh, it's just related to that, that same, um, well, to Commissioner Wheeler, Wheeler's statements. Um, so the, the, the retail or what, what's planned to replace the community retail designation won't necessarily affect the surrounding communities, but will be reserved for retail for the park. Is that one? Is that correct? It has community retail zoning, which obviously allows retail uh, by right. Should anyone choose to use it as such, the MC one also allows that by right. But I think informally they've said that's not the plan for this particular part of the site. Thank you, Mr. Pepper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we'll go to case number three. Staying with you, Mr. Pepe. Three is going to be Z223247. If you could share my presentation. So Z, oh, no. Next one, 247. <laughs> Thank you. So Z223247 is an application for a specific use permit for, you can go right on in, specific use permit for a utility or government installation other than listed, limited to, a, to an elevated water storage reservoir on property zoned to CS Commercial Service District on the east line of Executive Drive north of East Northwest Highway. And it's about 3.4 acres. Next slide. I kind of went past it pretty quick, but this is on Northwest Highway near uh, LBJ and Jupiter. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so the purpose is to allow the development of an elevated water storage tank. Next slide. There's the site as it exists today. It's pretty much undeveloped um, at this time. Uh, next slide. So to the west is Executive Drive. That's actually a, a public street. Office, surface parking across the way there. There's some multifamily to the northwest. There's an auto service center to the southwest. There's Three or four restaurants with drive-in or drive-through service to the south. And I think one of those undeveloped parcels is becoming a drive-through restaurant. Is why I say that. And vehicle or engine maintenance or and vehicle or engine repair and maintenance to the east um, as a private drive, private access to the to the east of this site. And then there's an undeveloped site to the north. So everything everything to the north. South East is uh, that CS district. Next slide. So it is an undeveloped 3.42 acre lot. Proposed uses is utility or government installation other than listed limit to an elevated water storage tank, otherwise known as a water tower. Utility or government installation, generally the whole definition is a utility other than listed is a public or private facility is certified franchise license or operated by the city as a utility that is not specifically covered by the use regulations in this chapter. That is to say we have 
other kinds of utilities that are covered in a that often are allowed by right or, or more simple. This is the type that does require an SUP because it's specifically listed here. Um, government other than listed as an installation owned or leased by a government agency that is not specifically covered by the use regulations in this chapter. Typical such government installations include city hall, courthouse, or an elevated water storage reservoir. The lot would be accessed from Executive Drive, and the proposed use requires that SUP for, for this use in CS District. Next slide. So our site from Executive Drive, looking east, now uh, next slide. You can see the, now where is this? This is a little farther east, looking a little southeast. You can see the restaurants on the right. Next slide. I think I'm on the private driveway, kind of looking northwest at the, the property itself. There's a bit of the property that's currently paved for whatever reason, whatever used to be there. I'm not quite sure, but there is a small paved portion of the site. Not really used, though. Um, but you can see the office that's kind of to the west. Uh, next slide. Looking straight north across the middle of the property, that's the old Fry's building um, in, the, in the far background. Next slide. Next, oh, thank you. And just a little bit farther east, next slide. That's looking at it from the adjacent drive, the property as it exists today. If it helps, the water tower is located in the eastmost part of the site, so it'd probably be in the vicinity of the, the middle ground here where you're looking. Um, you will see the site plan, but sometimes it helps to visualize in real life. Next slide. Then come back to executive and data, looking as a data drive um, going straight down the, the frame. There's some multifamily to the north. Uh, that said, the water tower is located on the farthest part from, from the, this side. Next slide. That's the office to the west across executive. Next slide. And the restaurants to the south of the subject site. Next slide. So existing CS districts, they have to follow all regulations associated with the CS district. Um, typically, utility and public service uses have some different regulations in terms of height. Uh, however, one of the stipulations is um, following residential proximity slope, which in this case they do. It does conform to that because it's pretty far from single family or residential. Next slide. SUP conditions contain the standard um, conditions. Um, their maximum height would be about 130 feet. Uh, of the of the tower and no expiration date. Um, the government installation other than listed use states that a parking requirement should be stated for the use to establish a parking requirement. Say the requirement is one in this case, they provide more than that. And next slide. Site plan as they propose it, again, accessed from executive drive, but it wouldn't be public access, um, fenced in, and then the water tower is located at the eastmost part of the site, a couple parking spaces back there. Next slide, a little zoomed in version. Next slide. Staff recommendation is approval for a permanent time period. Next slide, that's it. Thank you, sir. Questions, commissioners? Commissioner Hampton. Thank you, Mr. Pepe, could you go back to the site plan? Could we go back to the site plan? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you got it. Fronting on the street, there is a rectangular box that seems to be serviced by a drive. Do you know what that function of that is? I understand that's a, a utility box where it, it pulls a degree of, of utility from the, from, from the street, but DW may, may be able to answer that um, for us. Okay, and are there any um, requirements regarding the type of fence or any screening associated with this? It has to be, excuse me, it has to meet the base code of Article 10. Um, they did not include extra landscaping provisions or didn't, um, also didn't reduce their, their landscaping requirements. Um, I'm not sure what safety requirements they have for, for their fencing on site. Uh, we can ask them that if they have anything um, more intense in terms of security that, than, than what code requires. We can ask. 
and it's, I may have overlooked it. I just saw it called out as the fence. I wasn't able to determine what it was. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? Okay, seeing now we'll keep going. Case number four. Mr. Pepe, staying with you. Uh, it was brief before, number four. So uh, four is the uh, Z212277. I did receive an updated site plan. I'd be happy to show that if we could please. pull up the PowerPoint and then skip on down to the site plan. Um, they submitted a change after the docket, which I did have distributed to, to you folks, um, but I do want to make sure that's put forth here. Yeah, so those were the proposed site plan um, as they were today. Their proposed site plan distributed after the docket, added a landscape berm at the north part of the site. Staff did not object to that, um, but they did want, uh, after they had a community meeting, they did want some landscape buffering at the north part of the site. And if you continue on, staff recommendation is approval of the site, of the subject to a site plan as briefed and conditions. Questions, Commissioner Wheeler. Did they also make an update to their, I know that we don't use last, that their civil plans uh, to accommodate the drainage issue? That's, that's what they stated, but it, it is outside. So it's non-regulatory to our body, but they, I understand they did change that. And was that one of the biggest concerns of the community, that there was a drainage issue from the last time this SUP was approved? I understand they made this change and that change in response to the community meeting, yeah. Uh, were there any community meetings around this, um, for this uh, proposed uh, renewal and uh, extinction? I believe there was one, yes. A couple, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? Okay, we'll go to case number five. That was not briefed before. Thank you, Mr. Pepe. Ms. Munoz, good morning. Good morning. This case was actually briefed in conjunction with C212332. However, I am prepared to brief it again, as well as an update on the deed restrictions that have been volunteered. Shall I proceed? Please do. Okay, can everyone see my presentation? Yes, we can. Thank you very much, Chair. This item is Z212298. It's an application for a CS district, a commercial service district with consideration of a mixed use district on property that's currently zoned an agricultural district. It's located on the north line of Dowdy Ferry Road, northeast of LBJ Freeway I-20, and it contains just over 51 acres. The update to this case is that deed restrictions have been volunteered, which amend the usage guidelines for three of the uses, requiring a minimum of 80 rooms for any hotel or motel use, sets a maximum floor area that's reduced by 300 square feet for a general merchandise or food store by right, and notes that all queuing for a restaurant with drive-in or drive-through service use is required to be on site. No uses are prohibited in the deed restriction instrument that was volunteered, and no development standards are limited either. 
This property, as you can see, is located in the southeast portion of Dallas. And here is an aerial map. It also shows the adjacent sister case, uh, Z212332, which was recommended for approval by CPC in September uh, with deed restrictions volunteered by the applicant, which restricted several uses as well as included the three provisions that are included in today's deed restriction instrument for this larger portion of the overall site. And if you noticed on the aerial map, there are a few sparse uses in the vicinity. There is a public park located to the west and then to the north, we do have a batch plant and several single family uses all along Plainview Drive, a full neighborhood there. To the east, there are additional single family uses in the R75A district. And then we have undeveloped land to the northwest, as well as across I-20 to the south. Now, as I noted, this property itself is currently zoned in AA district. It is also undeveloped, as you could see in the aerial map. The applicant is proposing the CS district for the potential to redevelop the site or develop the site, excuse me, with a warehouse or other commercial and industrial uses, which are permitted in the proposed district. The CS district does allow several heavy commercial and light industrial uses that staff believes could have tangible land use impacts on the adjacent natural areas, creekways, floodplain, and residential properties. Therefore, we have recommended an alternative MU1 district, which allows for the development of the site with consideration of the low density and residential nature of the area while meeting development goals of the area plan. Here are some site photos showing the two sites in conjunction since they are within the same parcel at this northeast corner of Dowdy Ferry. All currently undeveloped. Now we are looking east on Dowdy Ferry where there's this single family neighborhood on Plainview. And then there are also um, that fenced area there is that concrete batch plant that existed to the north of the site that's adjacent. And then of course, these single family uses that abut that concrete batch plant at this time, which is actually for sale right now, not currently in use. And since my site visit, though, I'm unaware of the status of the property, but that was the view at the time. And as you can see, there are undeveloped properties adjacent to the site as well. This is to the south um, of I-20. And here we're looking at properties to the northwest and immediately across the park. Some interior views there of the park. Now, the development standards, we have the existing agricultural district, the proposed commercial service district, and the in lieu option presented by staff, which has several of the development standards for the proposed district, similar including the front yard and side yard setback with additional consideration given to residential adjacency in both those proposed districts. Now, the agricultural district does have significantly different setbacks. However, adjacent districts have already modified those. And overall, we do have a requirement that the most restrictive district on the block face would maintain continuity for those setbacks. What we are seeing, though, is a change in the height that's permitted, 45 feet for the proposed CS district and three stories. And then additionally, for the MU1 district proposed by staff, it could go anywhere between 80 and 120 feet. However, in both cases, residential proximity slope does apply. And so with the adjacent R75 district to the east, I do know that we will have RPS limiting the overall height of any project within this property, but with over 50 acres, 
there will be an opportunity for some height within the property. Now, the property is traversed by floodplain, though, so that, of course, and other natural elements of the site will also restrict what is able to be developed here. The biggest difference between these two districts is definitely the land uses which are permitted. The CS district, as noted, bring on heavy commercial and industrial uses with some supporting retail, personal service, and office uses. No residential is permitted. Therefore, we would see this site completely change from a currently agricultural use with natural features for the area, you know, maintaining the creek way, floodplain and such, to something more commercial, industrial in nature, and no opportunity for any residential development in the future, although being adjacent to residential uses. In lieu, the MU1 district gives an opportunity for development of this acreage with office, retail, personal service, lodging, and residential uses, not closing the door on that option for this area. Now to the north, a zone change was approved for an industrial district. However, it did include deed restrictions, which prohibited these uses, which are a little bit more um, intense in nature, although it did not prohibit several intensive uses as well. Now for a consistency review, there is an area plan here, the I-20 freeway corridor land use plan, which notes that this property is located in subdistrict two of their land use study. And the plan designates this property as being for retail or commercial uses. It also notes the significant natural open space that is in this area due to the presence of Prairie Creek and the Trinity River and proposes the proposed CS district does not align or is not consistent with both the proposed land use for this area of retail commercial or the character as called for by the plan. Additionally, absolutely no industrial uses are recommended for this subdistrict. However, there is a place for industrial uses in subdistrict one within this neighborhood on the southeast side of I-20 on both sides of Bonnie View Road. For this reason, staff has recommended the MU1 district in lieu of the requested CS district to add that compatible mix of uses and provide consideration of those natural resources, the floodplain, and investment into the adjacent park and trail system, which is the Great Trinity Forest Gateway Park and Horse Trails. And of course, the existing low density single family uses located to the north and east and farther to the northwest. Therefore, staff recommendation is denial of the CS district. As noted for the following reasons, the lack of support in the area plan, the residential adjacency, and the sensitivity of the natural features and floodplains not being supportive of the high intensity uses proposed in the CS district. Staff does recommend approval of an MU1 district in lieu. Finally, if CPC does recommend approval of the CS district subject to deed restrictions volunteered by the applicant today, the city council notice for public hearing will include the volunteer deed restrictions. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, commissioners? Commissioner Blair. Ms. Munoz, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Um, question for you. When it comes, or, or have you, did you know that this particular site on the Fort, the new Fort Dallas that's being proposed keeps this as a green space? No, I was not. And do you know, uh, were you aware of the, um, that it's wo heavenly wooded, isn't it? From the photos I was able to take, since it is a very large property, at the Dowdy Ferry side, it does not seem as wooded, but from the aerial photo, you can see in the interior where the floodplain traverses or bisects the property, there is a significant amount of trees, yes. Okay, and <clears throat> I remember in a previous case on this particular same lot, um, one of the things that the community was concerned about, were you aware, was that in that heavily wooded um, lot that there were trees that were 
100 years old, 100 plus years old. Were you aware of that? No, I wasn't, but I wouldn't be surprised considering the undeveloped nature and the significant floodplain there. Have we had a, it have, has, a, do you know if um, the arborist has had a chance to look at this particular area and assess it for the types of trees and the, and if there are trees that are, are protected? I'm not aware that an assessment has been done. Uh, definitely not in relation to this general zoning change. At this point, no permits have been requested. No plans have been proposed. No landscape um, provisions are being amended. Therefore, there would not be a trigger for any sort of review by our arborist unless he had dealt with this site in relation to another request type, maybe a building permit request or a previous zoning case that I'm unaware of. Okay, and this this lot it backs up to R seven five on the east, and and it's right across the street from the horse park on the west, and that ugly strip of uh, of the old batch plant to the north, and uh, uh, on the other side of that is residential. Correct. That's correct. So, a question for you um, in respect to the um, record, well, to the, the hotel, I would assume it would be a hotel and not a motel with a minimum of 80 rooms, correct? That is what's proposed in the deed restrictions that have been offered. And those, <clears throat> excuse me, those deed restrictions are for the MU1 and not the CS, is that correct? Not that I'm aware of. Um, that was for, not... So the deed restrictions you're, you, that was being spoken of are strictly for the CS, the proposed CS from the applicant, correct? To my understanding, yes. Otherwise, I hope the applicant can um, define. Further the... expand yeah, upon that. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So. Just to make sure that we are all on the same page, that the, the deed restrictions that were submitted and, and by the applicant was for their proposed uh, use of CS, which allows warehousing and more um, liberal uses than the MU1, correct? To my understanding, yes. And so under MU1, there are, there are no restrictions being requested because this, this MU1 is what the staff is recommending in lieu of the CS, correct? Staff would never recommend any deed restrictions. We have found that. No, MU1 no, I'm, I'm saying that, that, that you, you're, you guys are, re, there's no, there's nothing, there is nothing that the MU1 is is it's a total MU1 uh, um, recommendation because the, the, what this applicant is proposing is strictly for the CS. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? Commissioner Wheeler, please. So, so in this particular case, are we supposed to be looking at either if we deny the CS, then looking at the MU for approval, or has the applicant not applied for the MU? They have not applied for it, but staff did notice for it to give you the option because we find it to be more suitable. And the MU would fit more of the industrial environment that's in that area? No, it would not fit an industrial environment. It is not industrial in nature there. The, it's residential and there are lots of natural resources, so very low density, and there is a floodplain running through the property, so definitely not industrial. And so what would the, what would, can you go back a slide? Because I thought you said something about the MU would fit industrial or something. Maybe, let me, let me wake up. Hold on. Is there any way you can back to the slide where the, the last slide that you presented? Certainly. Huh? Yeah, but it was something that she wrote, isn't it? That I that I looked at. I woke up just in time. Hmm. 
This is the last okay. one. Oh, okay. So the area plan does not support industrial zone and residential base. Uh, Those are the and, reasons and, for denial of the CS district. And can, we can you show again what the MU would support? The MU1 would, district would support? So here on the development standards, I have the land uses, basically the primary uses permitted in each district. Okay, thank you. Certainly. Thank you. Any questions on this item, Commissioner? Yes, Commissioner Treadway. Chair, um, is is it possible to require some portion of this large um, piece of land to remain undeveloped because it does have so many trees? Is that something that has been discussed? At this time, a conservation easement has not been offered and it would be something separate that's done by other means. So right now it's just a zone change that they're requesting and it's just a general zone change. But you mentioned that the floodplain will restrict development. Um, yes. So that that's just a fact. Yes, uh, but how I'm not, I'm uncertain. It depends on how they proceed with applying through the floodplain review office to see what needs to be done in order to develop the site. And a conservation easement would come, can we require them to, to get one or how does that process work? I will ask Daniel to please assist with that question. I'm sorry, Commissioner Treadway, your question was, how do they get what permit? A conservation easement. So I'm just inquiring, what would the process be if we want to ensure that part of this is, is, is maintained as green space? Because I think I heard Commissioner Blair say that there is a plan underway and, and, and this is this, this land, one of the intents might be to, to preserve it as green space. So how does that process work to preserve it as green space? Give me one second to look that up, Commissioner Treadway. Commissioner Treadway, just a little clarification. Uh, for Dallas, on the future land use map is gonna identify the publicly owned land that's for green space, not all the green space. And this is privately or private. Thank you. Commissioner Anderson, you'll, you'll uh, come in right after Daniel has a clarification here. Okay, while well, he's looking that up, uh, Commissioner Anderson, we'll take your question next, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm wondering um, what the main development goals are um, for that site in that area. And, and I'm, I'm asking because I'm wondering, is there a way to protect the green space, um, but also develop? Um, so develop within the trees as, as opposed to um, raising the trees, because I think there may be some development goals that might 
we want to move that that area in that direction. But so what are the main development goals? And then is there a method where we could preserve trees and um, develop? Those are great questions. And that is something that I talked to the representative, Mr. Coker, about early on when I was determining to make the MU1 uh, recommendation instead in lieu of the CS district. We did discuss since there is no actual planned development at this time, there's no prospective buyer. There are only interested parties who all are seeking warehouse development. But at this point, it's still a speculative process of trying to rezone so that it's prepared for development. And so in talking to Mr. Coker, we talked about how they could instead use those natural features as an element that was an opportunity for development. So front, you know, along the natural resources, make it an asset to any potential development, try to preserve as many trees as possible. Of course, Article 10 has several provisions about protecting any historic trees, preserving trees, and of course, conservation. So all of that would be addressed through the building permit stage once it is rezoned or even now as an agricultural district, but first they have to get rezoned so that they can develop the site. We aren't actually working on planning the site. We're not designing the site at this point. It's just a rezoning and identifying what district and what future uses would be most appropriate. So that's what we've done today. Is there a way to um, require, for instance, a they maintain the 70% tree canopy as opposed to like floor area ratio or something like that? Or would that be out of bounds? This is just a general zone change. So anything that we are proposing has to fall within the bounds of that district. If the applicant wants to restrict themselves further in their deed restrictions offered, they can add additional limitations, so they can um, decrease the overall block coverage. They can reduce the development rights of the proposed district. They cannot add anything that's more that encumbers any additional provisions that are not required in our code, though. So I would look to our development code first and see what options they would already fall under before talking about how to require certain elements through the general zone change. Thank you, Ms. Munoz. So my interest would be um, trying to determine how we might be able to influence development in that area that is unobtrusive of the natural environment, yet still being more conducive for moving forward in a Dallas forward kind of way. Um, thank you for those great comments. That is clear to me, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To go back to your question, Commissioner Treadway, a conservation easement would be something that would be dedicated on a plat that the applicant would have to voluntarily provide when they come to get their property platted. We, thank you. Can we require them to get a conservation easement sort of, sort of piggybacking on uh, some of these other questions to require that, you know, 50% of the land be, you know, have a conservation easement? I mean, is there, is there a requirement that we can set at this stage or no? No, it doesn't look like it. It looks like a conservation easement is something that the applicant, when they are platting, comes and voluntarily says, hey, I'd like to add a conservation easement to conserve some of the trees and other natural features on the property, but it's not something that the CPC can impose on the applicant at this time or at the platting stage. And since platting is pretty much ministerial, we, we can't ask them to do that if they've just come in for a flat request, correct? That is correct. 
So there's no tools we have in our toolbox to encourage applicants to apply for a conservation easement. It has to be completely voluntary by them. That is correct. I think it's like uh, Jennifer said in, to, in response to Commissioner Anderson's question, um, at the applicant can provide deed restrictions mm -hmm. saying they want to keep some of those trees, but there's, this is just a general zoning change. So, I don't have uh, any more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Treadway. One, one quick follow up, uh, Ms. Munoz, to Commissioner Anderson and Commissioner Treadway's uh, kind of exploration. Uh, as you know, Article 10 provides different mechanisms to meet your tree mitigation, and one of them is to meet it on site, uh, where uh, the, the number of trees removed and uh, the inches of caliper could be met by saving some of these trees that we're talking about here. And so when we're talking about tools, although this is a general zoning change, the applicant could choose to say that uh, I'm going to try to meet my uh, tree mitigation on site and therefore through deed restriction set aside a piece of the property to do just that. Is that possible? I believe so. I think I've seen something similar in the past. However, whenever we get into conservation easements, I've had one other case in the past where they wanted to do it through a plan development district, and that was not a viable option for the same reason that we described or that Daniel uh, mentioned, is that it has to be something that is voluntary in nature and offered at the planning phase. But Chair did if the applicant wanted to deed restrict to protect some trees the applicant is more than able to do that this that is just not something that cpc can require of yes the applicant. that's correct yes it's all could be volunteered thank you for the clarification any other questions commissioners okay we'll keep moving mr pepe back to you sir staying in district eight This is going to be Z2231206. Thank you. We can skip ahead to the site plan as I believe we briefed this. There was just an update, minor update to the site plan and conditions. Yes, so this was the site plan you saw previously. We skip one slide or two slides ahead. Next one, I think. Yes. So you, you can see they made a minor change um, along the Creekway. Um, their site plan moves a couple of uh, the truck parking spaces, moves some of the pavement back uh, to a degree. And could you hit the next slide, see if that's conditions. Next one. We can come back to this if anyone needs to see it closer. They added a condition for a 30 foot buffer will be provided in the location shown on the site plan. Um, my understanding is that's meant to have buffering and the, the wet eastern boundary along the creek way um, where the use would, would abut or sort of slope off into the creek. So those are the changes. Um, staff recommendation remains as it is, denial. Um, all right, that's it. Thank you, sir. Questions? Okay, no questions. Let's go to case number seven. This was brief before, but I know that there are updates. Oh, yes, one, Mr. Pepe, one question for you, sir, sorry. Commissioner Blair, please. Um, Mr. Pepe, one of the reasons why you, you made the recommendation of denial is because of the um, the uh, proximity to the creek, correct? That's correct. And you're, one of the things that you stated on the, 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 the creek was that 
the, that the possible runoff would, would uh, if, if I remember correctly, one of the reasons was you stated in your report was that one of the, re the that the possible runoff could impede the health of the, the creek, correct? That's correct. But wouldn't, I just have a, a, a understand, I need a quick understanding. Would not in, um, in the permitting process, the engineers would look at that and make sure that the design standards that the developer was using would would not allow for that to happen? Yes, it's not necessarily about lot to lot drainage. It's also about uh, contamination of an in, of industrial use with a more than likely not a uh, pervious surface. Uh, so it's not necessarily a lot to lot drainage issue. They have to probably mitigate in terms of that, but there's contamination and, and erosion that may be, um, because the site, not just site to site, but the site includes a portion of the creek. So that sort of weighs into that, but we're at the same rate, yes. Engineering does review for uh, drainage over that amount of time, but contamination is, is still a possibility and a concern of, of our staff. But that's just a possibility, not a pr probability that it will. It's just a possibility that it could, correct? It is a likely scenario in the events of development with industrial uses. Um, we have a site plan, we have a new site plan associated with an SUP that includes a degree of buffer, but we are still changing from a agricultural zoning residential district to a commercial district, and there are still uh, by right uses that remain that are not bound to the site plan, not bound to the conditions. Um, and anytime we're dealing with general zoning changes, nothing's a guarantee as, as we know, um, but everything is a probability question. And the probability of a um, of an inappropriate side design is not necessarily controlled for um, just by the SUP if there are by right uses as well. So that plays into evaluation of this site plan and the amended site plan and, and everything else. But couldn't that not be said by any kind of zoning change that we offer that there is a possibility that there could be something negatively impacting the environment or the, the community in which it sits? Yes, certainly. And general zoning changes come with uncertainty, as we've discussed moments ago as well. Um, but it's what's the most likely scenarios, what are the median scenarios, um, we, we can never tell. But general zoning categories are, are a mix of, of outcomes. Um, and so obviously there's potential harm in many requests, uh, but staff evaluated is uh, more likely to have uh, but, but adverse would, impacts than, than especially the existing zoning. But wouldn't that not be something that the engineers would make the, dis the determination at a later time in the process? Engineering will do drainage review, but there we're not going to have the same. Uh, we're not we're not going to be able to predict anything in regards to other uses that are permitted by right in CS or, or other things like that. But didn't the applicant uh, offer up deed restrictions to limit the uses at, so that this is not a true un? filtered CS zoning? One of the uses that they are proposing is a by right CS use, the vehicle, vehicle or, or commercial engine parking. repair mm -hmm. maintenance. That is a by right use that's in the CS. Under CS, you don't really have a means to say, well, this can or can't, has limits on it or certain limits on it. Um, and at the same rate, approving a commercial district with all the Three, two or three uses taken out is not good land use planning. It's not. It's not planning at all. It's. It's. It's choosing a particular site for a use. I think we. Can you put your, your slide back up so you can see the layout of? Uh, or do you have that? If you could, uh, George. And the site plan. Yeah, the, the site plan, and in that site plan, the, the 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 what you're speaking of is on the west side of the development, not on the creek side. Correct. This is Z two two three one zero six. 
They added a provision for a 30-foot buffer associated with the SUP. No, that's not what I asked. I asked, is not the, the engine repair on the west side of the development, which is not on the creek side? The creek side would be the south and the east. Because it's a by right use, it's not actually tied to the site plan, that use. The commercial motor vehicle parking is, is tied and controlled by an SUP site plan, but vehicle engine repair and maintenance in a different scenario in this scenario is not limited to the, um, is not limited to the site plan. So are you saying that this particular site, this particular site and the layout is something we should not even consider because this is just a general zoning? It's, it's, it's a multi, as you know, multi-part re review. We, we, can, we can have um, an expectation of certainty should they develop these site plan. The site plan is regulatory for the commercial motor vehicle use. But we are approving, one, a general zoning change, and two, an SUP. As you know, there's multi-part, so they could scrap. Nothing holds them, says, I need to do an SUP. When I get an SUP and a general zoning change on a property, nothing says I must develop my SUP to use. I could switch it up. And I'm not saying I don't trust them or that they are, um, you know, that they're lying to you or anything like that. I'm stating a fact because we're trying to make plans for districts and properties over several years, over several decades, potentially. So, so in looking at this site plan and just hear what i'm saying the way that this site plan is laid out that they not only is there a 30-foot buffer being offered by the applicant along the creek but there is not any commercial vehicle parking on the south side and there and, and on the oh what is that that's at the east side yeah there not not only is the 30-foot buffer but there is a drive path that would also buffer the parking of any commercial vehicles along the creek side correct that is true of the commercial motor vehicle parking use, yes. And on the west side, there is no creek at all. That's correct. That's a residential adjacency on the west. Um, let, let's, let's just change the, the, the questioning for a minute for what is this particular area you, in your report you said that it's transitional and you need and you were looking for walkability is that not correct i don't remember i don't believe i mentioned walkability necessarily um because i think it's a def, um, let me that would be I, a dif, let me go to it i think it'd be a difficult um undertaking to a degree we're not going to to fool ourselves in that regard um but i do think that um commercial heavy commercial uses in proximity to residential uh, could impact that. I do, it is part of the um, comprehensive plan which applies to the entire city. So I did list that as a goal there. Um, and I think that's not necessarily saying there's gonna be a density or, or walkability here, um, but in, in a traditional sense, but if there is going to be any amount of homes nearby, um, which the area, surrounding his own residential um, could have an impact on, on any possibility for that. But isn't this, isn't this, one of the things you said in your, your, in your report was this is an area that's in transition. And isn't not, it isn't not the transition, not towards residential, but towards heavy industrial and commercial since this is um, along the same pathway as all kinds of warehousing in PD 761, which is the International Inland Port of Dallas, correct? 
I don't, I don't remember mentioning that I would call it in transition. I think that there is transition in the broader area. We're talking miles. Uh, I acknowledge PD, uh, the industrial PD 761. PD 761 uh, is just inland port. Yes, I, I mean, I acknowledge that. This is a, that's a wider area in, in our assessment that this block um, is maintaining a degree. The south side of the block for a good distance, we're talking a third of a mile on either side, is maintaining and isn't necessarily in transition. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't make that argument that this block is in transition and it's remained agricultural in line with its zoning. But isn't right across the street a, a, a major warehouse that just has recently been built within the last two years, three years? And then when you look down on the west side, isn't the uh, Kroger distribution center on the same street um, that has been built within the last five years? And didn't we, this body, in the last year, um, working with Mr. Baldwin, we did a development right across the street, right there at Travis Trail and on the north, on the north side of Telephone Road, a um, warehouse right next to a um, residential use. And we approved that as well, correct? Yes, and, okay. and we're aware of those changes. I'm not going to say that, that they aren't there. So I'm going to pull up um, the last slide, but nothing past the last slide. I might have the slide hidden in my pocket. Uh, if you go on the aerial map, I, I do want to say that I recognize those. This is a spread out area. This is um, because it is agricultural to a degree in nature. Lots are big. The distances are farther than they look, may look on a map. So we do evaluate that while changes have happened to the east, to the north, Telephone Road, very wide street, forms a pretty pretty solid distance between those uses up there and, and down here. Um, we're looking at a stretch of two miles um, end to end on this photo. It's, things are, are quite spread out here. But it, it isn't the, but okay, and the, the residential or the, residential like use that's right next door in your last reporting you said that it didn't even have a co for what it, the use it's 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 not just residential but it's a horse park or something that doesn't even have a co so that is it not that the resident are you aware that um most of the residential uses are illegal in nature for because they don't they're not only just residential but they are industrial like uses as well as far as parking vehicles and trucks and everything else what i would say and you can tell from from this image our property undeveloped agricultural agricultural properties to the west that are i would not categorize a long telephone that are on the south side that are not um in my assessment, um, breaching the bounds of agricultural zoning as you go southwest to the east, agricultural zoning should be limited to agricultural or residential uses. Um, and because that is not a permitted use, whatever activity is occurring on the site didn't necessarily play into our judgment that, oh, this, this area is, is commercial uh, because the use of the right is the east is um well, a little gonna... commercial in nature, although but it's still zoned agricultural. But it didn't play into our assessment because I I'm just going to ask of one more... lack of CO. Sorry, I I'm just going to ask one more question. Okay, and then I'm going to I'm going to let anyone else ask anything. If this is where the city of Dallas has designated industrial uses and warehousing. Would it not be better to utilize that service here than along residential uses that are in the major part of the city where we need we need housing? Thank you. Your, your question, your your question makes makes total sense to me, and I concur. It may be a difference in how we're assessing and applying that principle um, as a. Planner, broadly, 
um, I find that we should have distinct areas of development, distinct areas of agriculture, and distinct areas of uh, open space or nature. Um, it's less beneficial to the city, to ecology, to, to have leapfrogging, things like that. And as such, we assess this part of our block as a significant collection of open space, as a significant collection of agri agricultural use, but you're exactly right. Um, eating up additional industrial land uh, where it's inappropriate is bad, and um, finding appropriate spaces for industrial is important. Uh, where, and, and I would just add that Finding space for industrial is important where there's an established pattern. And, and we evaluate it, I, I understand, differently, um, but there are places where it should be filled in and places where it's, we evaluate it as a significant open space that should remain, or agricultural space. Thank you, sir. Any other questions, commissioners, on this item? It's 10, Commissioner Wheeler, please, and then Commissioner Anderson. Isn't one of the by right, uh, did you say that one of the by right uh, uses is a commercial um, motor vehicle repair? Or is that by SUP? So the SUP use is commercial motor vehicle parking. That one requires an SUP in the commercial service district when located within 500 feet of a residential district. This one is located near a residential, it's surrounded by residential zoning in this case. The other uses that need to be maintained that are CS uses are vehicle engine, vehicle or engine repair and maintenance, which I understand generally applies to general vehicles, not commercial motor vehicles, uh, but because they'd also be fixed in trucks, that use is well, machi like machinery, heavy equipment, or truck sales and service, which is a it's a by right use in CS. So if they are, but if those are by right use, wouldn't we wouldn't we be in fear of pollution? Or from that also, the by right uses? Could you read that real quick? So if the commercial, if the commercial repair uh, or, the, or repairs of any sorts of vehicles is right by a creek that they cannot get by right, wouldn't we be just as concerned if the by right use? And, and because the, it would actually, the by right uses would actually be more a, a polluting than what they're asking because they will be changing all. They will, could be um, transmission fluid, any of those things that can leak into leaking into the uh, creek. Whereas the commercial parking, it's probably a lesser chance. I I would agree with you. There's concern about by right uses like heavy engine heavy. It always trips me up. It's such a tongue twister. Machinery, heavy equipment, or truck sales as service. There is concern about that. That is not allowed by right at this time. We're approving a two-part request. We're talking about agriculture zoning, residential district, to CS, and that's how they get that machinery, heavy, yada, yada, by right. Um, so, so currently, the, the zoning doesn't allow it by right. They have agricultural zoning concurrently. Current zoning is agriculture, allows residential, crop production, and animal production. Uh, okay, so. But, so we're, okay. but that's where the caution I was cautioning earlier, <laughs> where we're approving, yes, an SUP for commercial motor vehicle parking, but we're also pr approving a general zoning change that has a few uses that they need that are very intense, and they are by right, and they're not held to site plan in the same way. So uh, we can't really see because the internet is now, because um, I wouldn't ask you this next question. Now, approximately how many homes are adjacent to this site? We talked about that last time, but across telephone, there are four or five homes in a little pocket subdivision uh, in the ag zoning, which is a residential district. And then along the street, there are large estate homes um, on telephone, um, some of them doing you know, sort of light horse raising, what have you. Uh, some of them are just single family, but that's by all means a typical use of ag zoning. So, so this is where, right, where we meet industrial meets residential, and, and it's that hard decision, even though that that part of the city has been zoned for, um, has been zoned as the port or such. 
Um, is that okay? I get it. The so, yeah, the south side of street has still has mostly ag zoning for third of a mile either way from this site. That's why we we uh, identified it as a significant collection of ag zoning. By no means can you say there's not industrial zoning to the east, but this is a rural area. These are large lots. The maps are a little deceptive as to what distance is. And the warehouse, the warehouse is not a, not a great um, tool for scale because it is, it is very large. Um, but again, north side of the street assessed differently than the south side of the street. But these, these lots are quite big. And so do you know if there was any community engagement with this, because you, what you do know is I'm often um, a critic when it comes to in residential moving into industrial and also the opposite side. Um, but was there any community engagement? Because this would be one of those cases that would cause for a community engagement of sort. I, I don't, I don't know of any uh, specific community engagement. We sent, we sent letters to property owners within 400 feet. We received a couple of replies in opposition, but I don't know of any other um, community engagement beyond that. Uh, applicant may be able to answer that. So, because I, I, what I do know is that we've had a case that it was prior to me, and it was, but I remember it, a case in the same area that we were, that it was denial for some of the same factors. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if, if there's a collection of homes further east, they, based on the map, wouldn't be in the, wouldn't be in the letter notification distance, but they're certainly uh, valid to, uh, to be uh, engaged to. Commissioner Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so these questions revolve around the buffer that is planned around the creek. Um, what, what definition of buffer are are we considering in that area? Is it just or is it bioswells and landscaping? So what's the definition of buffer that we that's a good question. The condition as proposed by the applicant doesn't specify what the nature of the buffer is. At this time, they could offer further clarification for ease and permitting, but they did not um, specify. It's, it just says buffer. So we didn't uh, support that change necessarily, but um, it, is, it is unclear to a degree. Well, in protecting the watershed, um, are there any requirements for buffers um, in the watershed plan that you're aware of? They have to do the, the typical um, improvements when they're working around a floodplain to keep floodplain off of the developed part of the property, keep floodplain at the floodplain, but I, I don't know beyond that. Um, that is an engineering decision later on. The 30-foot buffer is not likely going to be read by the engineering staff. It's going to be read by the zoning staff. Um, and then they will interpret buffer however they choose. Could we require um, bioswells and things that protect the watershed where it's adjacent to creeks and also um, adjacent uses so that you know, we create both a, a beautification buffer and a protective buffer for the for that watershed. Language that addresses a natural buffer or a permeable buffer or something to that degree could be added into the SUP language to further clarify. But I will state that that's only going to apply to the SUP use of commercial motor vehicle parking, not the general zoning uses as we discussed previously. Yeah, I think that would be appropriate in trying to protect any kind of contaminants from, from getting into that, that creek um, and if that were to happen. So, um, and also lastly, does Article 10 apply? And is there anything we can influence through Article 10 on this zone of change? Article 10 will apply for any of the uses developed on the site. I don't, I don't, no, of all of the, I don't believe that regulates interaction with floodplain necessarily or creeks, uh, but the 
standard requirements for site trees, um, residential buffers, those are built into Article 10 and are required by any kind of use, but they may not be the kind of creek protection you're looking for in, in your line of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Pepe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pepe. We're going to keep moving. Thank you, sir. Uh, commissioners, case number seven has been briefed before, but I know we do have updates. Ms. Garza, good morning. Could you share uh, 223179? And then you can go to slide seven. So the history I found about the area of requests um, was that on May 27, 1971, City Plan Commission recommended Industrial 1 District for the Track 7, where the area of request is at, um, and they also recommended 2 Family 2 District for Track 8, which is the south portion of the area of request. Um, let me just... So CPC did question why staff uh, recommended 2F2 and not I1 uh, to the south. Uh, staff uh, mentioned um, they did not want to extend industrial to the south, possibility of strip zoning to the west. Reason for residential zoning to the west um, is because it is, um, in, it is not good for industrial zoning. And the main reason they recommended industrial one on track seven uh, was that there were properties already developed with for industrial, and track eight provides a buffer zone between track seven and the undeveloped land uh, south of the city limit line. Um, they also, it was mostly undeveloped land where concentrations of residential, several industrial, commercial, and retail uses along Ledbetter. Some, indu some industrial uses were batching uh, plants, warehouses, rodeo rings, uh, pigging plant and constructor storage, numerous um, house trailers and several trailer parks, as well as industrial lots. Um, so the area, that all that area of request was annexed um, in December 1968. Um, you can go to the second, the slide eight. Um, so as I mentioned, the whole entire area was annexed um, in December 1968, um, and they were usually it was mostly agriculture. And then in 1971 is when a city recommended um, the uses. And then on March 6, 1972, City Council did pass the ordinance to rezone the nine tracks, and with the recommendation of industrial for track seven and um, TH3 for. Uh, the southern portion, which is um, track nine. Thank you very much for the update. Questions, commissioners? We we can we can ponder the wisdom of our own decisions. Fifty years from now, they'll be looking back. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Herbert, please. Uh, Thank you, Liliana, for um, doing the research. I know you had to dig uh, pretty deep into some pretty dusty files and maps. So thank you for that. Um, there was some community engagement on this case. Were you aware of that? No, I was not aware. OK. Um, thank you. I think the history was brought up by some of the, the residents um, and kind of confirms exactly what you said. Um, I saw some of the documents as well. Did you notice that they? You mentioned that they were um, as a buffer, but did you notice that they used specific language that said um, to prevent industrial creep into the residential areas? 
Yes, and then as well, they did mention um, the reason why they also buffered is because that was the city limit, and they didn't know what the un the southern portion, which was with with not in the city limit, was still undeveloped, so they didn't want it to go through. Gotcha. Thank you, yeah. Commissioner House. Right. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on page seven thirteen of our report, where there's the aerial map. On the aerial photograph, um, the land use pattern, the development pattern does is not reflective of the zoning by any stretch of the imagination. In other words, the TH yeah. land has trucks wow. and industrial use on it, just like Good the IR her. land. Um, and, and can you perhaps enlighten us on why that might be or what? Are these uses non-conforming? Are they illegal? Um, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to understand why what I see on page 7-13 uh, doesn't appear to um, follow the zoning at all. I'll tell you his name. Yeah, I, I am not aware. Um, as I mentioned, um, those properties were already, um, during that time, they already had industrial development, um, they may be not non-conforming. Um, and then um, to the property to the west, I mean east of it, um, a portion is to, towards the TH3 um, is actually industrial. Um, there is a portion, um, but the, the other portions which are within the TH3, I'm not aware. Commissioner Herbert, please. Yeah, to reference um, the commissioner's question, um, it seemed that those are illegal uses. We're working with code compliance to address those issues. Um, there were two cases here at CPC, one in 2017, one in 2020, where SUP was issued on two of those lots on the far west side. And in those meetings, it was also stated that TP, the, the townhouse should remain they even added a deed restriction so the gentleman can add a fence to, to protect the, T, the uh, TH3 and his industrial. I don't think that was ever done. Um, the, the fence was never put up and the, the uses extended past his line. Um, so they are illegal uses, uh, usage across the board, even where the SUP was issued. Any other questions, commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Hall. Has there, has there been any recent applications to build townhomes or residential in these areas? Not that I'm aware of. Not for a number of years or nothing on the books now? No, not that I'm aware of. Hmm. All, all of the uh, feedback that we got from the public, they wanted to keep it residential or whatever, but there's, there's been no applications or any, no planned development that we're aware of. No, no. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Wheeler. Isn't it true that right, um, maybe a lot or two over, that there is a residential use, but it, it's, uh, it's listed as commercial because it is a um, mobile park, mobile home park that has been there for, for well over 20 years, 30 years? Like, yes, 50, so, 60 something. Yes, so to the east, um, there are two SUPs, which is number 398 and number 554, which are for um, Mobile Home Park. Their zone was I Industrial 2. And then there is also a PD 263, uh, which is for a Mobile Home Park. And how long is those SUPs for? Um, so SUP number 398 was approved by council in 1968 and SUP 554 was approved in 1986, as well as PD 263. The long-term PD, I mean, SUPs, instead of, right? Yes. Maybe we should rebrief. Is, is there any way we can be, maybe we might need rebriefing because we have so many new commissioners on this particular case? 
The reason why I was briefed uh, is because uh, I believe last um, CPC um, you, commissioners asked uh, for history of why the TH3 was um, zone TH3. No, we're talking about the original briefing because it's been a month or two. And so we have quite a few, new, so that don't, maybe don't understand the context of why um, there's a pushback by the community for this particular um, deal. I know that you gave us the new information, but this one was maybe two two months ago, August maybe. Okay. Uh, so the reason, um, so for the area, this um, case is for an application for a CS commercial service district on property zone and IR industrial research district to the north portion and TH3A uh, townhome district um, to the southern portion. Uh, so the applicant um, is requesting a CS commercial service district for both portions of both uh, districts in the area of request um, in order to allow a warehouse development. One quick question, as Garza remind us, this is a 20 acre site. The front portion is IR, the back po portion is TH. What, what is the size of those two? Yes, so the, uh, the whole entire area of request is 20.032. Um, I'm not too sure um, overall what each mm -hmm. um, district is of acreage. Maybe the applicant will know that. So I'm, I'm curious that the... Uh, I believe it's 6 and 14. Pardon 14 me? on the front, 6 on the back. 14, 14 IR, 6 on the back. Mm -hmm. And so the, the applicant today by right could use the 14 acres, is that correct? That's correct. For the, so so they're, they're basically uh, looking to add the 6 acres in the back into whatever the use could be up front. Yes. That could already be done today by right. Correct. Because it is, um, so the north portion is industrial research, so warehousing is allowed by right. Um, however, the TH3, they are wanting to use that portion um, and staff recommended instead of an IR to do both um, districts uh, to see as commercial service, which is a le a less intense than the industrial district. And then just to, just to summarize to make sure I understand uh, the, the fruit of the research that you conducted, essentially 50 years ago, the plan commission decided to split these into two IR yes. and townhouse. Correct. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Wheeler. Was that to give a buffer to the, to the residential neighborhoods? So the, they didn't say that it was for the residential, it's just that that line, the uh, southern line of the TH3 track, which is track nine, that was the city limit. Um, and the city um, didn't, so the portion on the south of that line it was still not within city and it was undeveloped. Um, so staff um, wanted, uh, recommended that buffer in order for industrial not to go through because um, they were not they were not sure what the undeveloped um, portion was going to be developed for. Well, did not the community on the la uh, that came in on the on at the last time this was before CPC before we set it off. Did not the community issue was that they wanted to keep that buffer. Um, between the community and that IR zoning so that it wouldn't push into the community and any, um, and, and also is it that the, um, the, the applicant wants to build warehousing of sort and that was a major concern for those? Yes, for, for last CPCs. Vice Chair Rubin. Uh, Commissioner Herbert. Yes. Um, are you aware of the case where that entire area, once it was annexed to the city, the rest of the southern sector, that it was all split into multifamily, residential, single family, R75, R105, so on and so forth? No, I was not aware. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Carpenter. Now this is a straight zoning request to change the entire track to CS, correct? Correct. So even though the express desire is to build warehouse use, um, that tract of land would not be committed to a warehouse use. Any use that's allowed by right in CS would be allowed on this com entire tract if the zoning change were approved. Correct. Okay. Now, just for continuity purposes, the last case that we just had briefed, the staff recommendation was denial, 
of a straight of a zoning change to CS, although there was a, an additional component of an SUP for one specific use. And the staff recommendation was denial, largely because of the potential impact of some of these by right CS uses on an adjoining residential neighborhood. However, in this case, the staff is recommending approval of a straight zoning change to CS where there's considerable residential adjacency to the south um, with the same situation being faced by the, the neighbors that any CS use by right could go in there. Could you, or would you have any, um, could you offer any explanation as to why we're ending up with opposite recommendations in, in similar situations? So in this case, um, the adjacent properties are um, industrial and that portion of TH3 does not have, right now currently have access to any street. Um, so it would just be a landlocked parcel. So that's why staff recommending um, to be able to develop that property um, to rezone to CS. But because it's landlocked now, doesn't mean that a street couldn't be constructed in the future, correct? Correct. All right. Thank you. Any other questions on this item, commissioners? We'll keep going. Thank you very much, Ms. Garza. We'll go to case number eight. I have no, no updates on that case and it was brief. Is this case getting held, Commissioner Herbert? Yes. Do you have a date to be determined? Um, two, two meetings from now. Two meetings from now. That will be. I'm sorry. November 16th. That would be November 16th. Am I calling again? No. I want to work through the letter that he sent at least. And give it's November 16th. Okay with you, Commissioner Herbert? Excellent. We will brief it then. That takes us to uh, case number nine. Mr. Pepe, back to you, sir. Busy guy today. Busy every day, actually. You just don't see it. <laughs> um, yes, thank you for pulling this up. So this is E223226. It is next slide. And it's located off of Buckner, um, south of I-30, and it's an application for, a, for one, a CR community retail district with the restrictions volunteered by the applicant, and two, a specific use permit for the sale of alcoholic beverages in conjunction with the general merchandise or food store greater than 3,500 square feet or on property zoned in NSA neighborhood service district with a D1 liquor control overlay on the west line of South Buckner Boulevard between Cloverhaven Street and St. Francis Avenue. It's about approximately three acres. Next slide, please. And the purpose of the request is to allow the development of a general merchandise or food store greater than 3,500 square feet with the sale of alcoholic beverages. Next slide. So this is the area of view of the property. As you can see, it's undeveloped now. It's a mix of uses uh, surrounding it. Uh, next slide. Fronts on Buckner. Can't find a good way to stand. Uh, to the north, there's a collection of single family attached homes in a TH zoning. Across Buckner, there's warehousing. To the south, there's the general merchandise food store, less than 3,500 square feet, and a motor vehicle fueling station. And then there's some multifamily to the west. Um, really quick, what you're seeing here, you see the zoning, but you also see the D1 overlay. That's all of the blue, just for context. Next slide. So it, as I said, it's a three acre lot. The proposed use is a general merchandise or food store greater than 3,500 square feet. In this case, um, it's a grocery store and access from South Buckner. Current zoning does not, NSA does not allow general merchandise or food store greater than 3,500 square feet. CR district does allow that by right. Um, they also have a D1, as I stated, and that is what requires the grocery store being developed to request an SUP should they want to sell alcoholic beverages in the grocery store. So there's beer or wine. Next slide. 
and they've also proposed deed restrictions that uh, limit some of the uses in that CR. Purpose of CR district is to provide for the development of community serving retail, personal service, and office uses at a scale and intensity compatible with residential communities. Staff recommends a base CR district as this district, um, the deed restrictions as proposed do not offer significant regular oversight beyond the base district and because the Buckner corridor generally includes a blend of commercial, residential, and light industrial uses. Next slide. Changed up. Uh, so this is looking at the site, um, looking west. Buckner is behind me. Looking west, next slide. A Little bit further southwest, you can see the existing Motor Vehicle Fueling Station and the General Merchandise and Food Store associated with that. And you, way in the background, you can see multifamily uh, to the west. Next slide. And then turning around, looking kind of southeast, or I guess it's just east on, on Buckner, there's industrial across Buckner. Uh, warehousing, next slide. More of that, next slide. And then there's another warehouse to the northeast, next slide. Buckner's a three lane in each direction at this point. There's a sidewalk in front. Uh, we're looking north. There's the, the attached single family along uh, the street to the north, uh, kind of in the background here. Next slide. And then that's looking due south of the motor vehicle fueling station to the south. Next slide. So as for development standards, um, fairly similar between CS and NSA. Uh, in terms of uh, setbacks, uh, FAR height is, is a bit higher in this base CR, uh, but it is NSA at this time and there is residential nearby, so that, that puts some limits on what can be done under the CR zoning. Next slide. So here's the site plan, uh, associated only with the SUP request, shows the um, general merchandise food store, as it exists, next slide, and we'll zoom in a little. A little better. Yeah, and then that, again, shows the grocery store as it's proposed, um, that the SUP is only associated with the sales of alcohol in a proposed store. Um, next slide. So because it's multi-part, I do wanna break it down. We're talking about NSA, current zone into CR. They need that to build the larger store uh, because that's that size of store is not allowed in the NS. Specific use permit for alcohol beverage sales in that store proposed, and then deed restrictions that limit the uses of CR. So next slide. SUP conditions are proposed. Uh, adherence to the site plan for this use. Uh, expires in five years. Uh, they added an additional buffering for eight foot solid screening fence along the northern adjacency where they border some single family uh, townhome and the residential buffer required by, that's the residential adjacency buffer. Um, normally it's 10 feet, they've increased it to an average 20 and the maximum floor area for the sale of alcoholic beverages is the 16,000 feet which is the size of the store shown in the uh, side plan. And that's those. Next slide, please. So the applicants proposed deed restrictions. Um, they, these are them. These are taking out some of the SUP uses that are in the CR. Um, so staff evaluated them as not adding in a, too much additional regulatory oversight um, on the property because most of these uses would have to come back for a another hearing if they were to be developed in the base CR, except for pawn shop, college dormitory, and public school. Those are by rights CR uses. And so as a result, staff recommends based on the area that the deed restrictions are, are, are not necessary. They're not adding much to, to our oversight and CR is generally appropriate along this corridor. Next slide. Yep, just wanted to get that in then. So. Staff recommendation is approval of a CR community retail district without the deed restrictions and approval of a specific use permit for sale of alcoholic beverages in conjunction with the general merchandise or food store greater than 3,500 square feet 
for a five-year period subject to a site plan and conditions. Thank you, sir. Questions? Commissioner Hampton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Pepe, um, the site plan layout, can you help me understand there's two curb cuts, but it appears that this is an interior lot. Are they connecting to the adjacent um, property? I believe they may work out an access agreement to the property to the south. So there's that gas station to the south. North is, plan north is west in this, so north is to our, our right. Um, so they have access from Buckner per this, but they're proposing an access agreement with the gas station to the south, which is not part of this, not part of this approval, but it's in their plan. Okay, and so then the two residential adjacencies, and I'm going to use this planning orientation, are to the right and to the top of the page. Is that correct? Yes. And both of those require the 20-foot buffer that's noted in the um, SUP conditions. They they are adding in a. They're adding an additional, if we could go to the conditions slide, George. Um, thank you. Yeah, they're requesting the eight foot solid buffer, um, or excuse me, the eight foot fence along the northern adjacency and the, and the 20 foot buffer along the northern adjacency. They leave 20 foot um, of space in the, plan north, the western adjacency, uh, where it abuts multifamily, uh, but that doesn't abut, abut a parking area at this time. They ha they are going to be held to standard uh, Article 10 buffering there, which is 10 foot. Okay, well, I noticed that the loading area appears to be oriented on the west upper side of the site plan and our plan orientation. It just, I was wondering if there was any discussion about noise mitigation hours of operation just to help mitigate the, the impacts of that site orientation? They have to, yeah, so they have to follow the base Article 10 screening for, for loading areas as well as residential adjacency screening. Um, the buffering that was put in on the north is, is additional to that, but it doesn't preclude them from doing any kind of buffering on the west. Um, it's important to remember this pertains to the sale of alcoholic beverages. so it doesn't necessarily give us as much oversight over the development of a general merchandising food store broadly as would if, if the SUP was for that. Excellent <laughs> clarification and thank yeah. you for that. Um, and I just want, want to make sure that I also understand, again, this is just site layout, perhaps not part of the alcohol beverage discussion, but the dumpster is also oriented on that west property line, is that correct? Yes, and that will still have the base Article 10 screening requirements. But the west, or the, I guess it's the east part of that multifamily property, that's the parking area portion of that site. There's, a, there's some distancing between that site and uh, the multifamily buildings. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pepe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Wheeler. Are you aware of any community engagement that has happened around this project? I'm not. Um, are you aware that they are going um, beyond what the standards is to make sure that that buffer on that side, on the side that's adjacent to the residential, that there's an additional buffer to for noise or, um, that was a concern for the community? That is required by the conditions and, and plan, yes. And they're proposed as a grocery store, am I correct? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you both. Any other questions, commissioners? Commissioner Wheeler, please. And are you aware that this is one of those food deserts areas? I uh, didn't assess that in, in our analysis. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? Okay, we'll keep going. Thank you very much, Mr. Pepe. Uh, commissioners will now go to uh, number 10, our development code amendment. Skills, good morning. Good morning, Andrea Gillis, Planning and Urban Design. I'm going to be a little bit of a palate cleanser from zoning cases and shift into a code amendment. 
Um, I'm just waiting for the presentation to come up. Oh, perfect, thank you. Um, this is case 223007. It is specifically related to a code amendment for the neighborhood stabilization overlay um, within the zoning ordinance. Um, I'm just going to do a quick run through of how we got here and um, lay out some of the issues that came to our attention over the past few months. Um, I just want to emphasize that this is a pretty minor amendment to the Neighborhood Stabilization Code, um, or ordinance, I should say, and that it is intended to do sort of a quick fix but also understanding that we really do need a comprehensive update to the neighborhood stabilization overlay to evolve it to address issues that we're dealing with today um, in residential neighborhoods. So that is to come, but that's probably gonna take about, I would say six, nine months to a year, depending on engagement, depending on how extensive we get with the neighborhood stabiliza stabilization overlay. So this is this first immediate fix um, that we found in the code. Um, next slide, please. So the neighborhood stabilization overlay, um, the amendment relates to that and specifically relating to the height plane definition and how height is measured because it is a unique, um, it is a unique set of standards specific to the neighborhood stabilization overlay. Next slide, please. Um, and so this is just some history and background through the process. The neighborhood uh, stab stabilization overlay was established in 2005. So at this point, you can imagine in 2005, building was very different in, or in many ways, was very different in um, our residential neighborhoods that were looking to establish some compatibility standards. Um, we have some different development types happening today, so which were not addressed through the 2005 ordinance. So that's one of the issues that we're looking at here. There are 13 neighborhoods that have adopted NSOs. Of those 13 neighborhoods, I think it's eight that actually have height standards. It's a pretty high threshold and bar to incorporate height standards into a neighborhood stabiliz stabilization overlay, you need 60% of owners of property to be, a they need to sign on to a petition for there to be high, a height maximum included within the overlay. Um, there are some other issues. The other issues that you can address within the NSO is setbacks, garage placement. Um, it's, pretty, it's a pretty minimal set of standards, um, but height has the higher bar. Um, so what we've sort of found is that in recent, it's probably been over a year that we started to hear some issues about how height was measured and some of the concerns and the perceived approvals that had, or the perceptions of the approvals that had been going through in, cer in certain neighborhoods. Um, I actually heard some of these things through some of our Forward Dallas discussions. Um, actually at our meetings, people came to us and said, hey, can you guys help us? What's going on? Um, we looked into some of those. Um, I can say that you know a lot of them were, I mean, most of them were in compliance with the code, and so that's partly why we are addressing this amendment today, because it wasn't really getting the results anymore that some of the neighborhoods had anticipated um, based on sort of evolving development trends. Um, and so we wanted to really, this is just a clarifying of the ordinance. Um, and it really came to light through, there was a recent Board of Adjustment um, case that went forward for a variance to the height um, requirements within one of our neighborhood stabilization overlays. And through that discussion, if anybody listened to that, um, it became very apparent how confusing the code was in general, um, and in particular as it related to height. And we really needed to take a look at um, some of the issues to make sure to clarify moving forward how we were addressing the height in these areas. Next slide, please. Um, this is just the, the purpose. Again, I had mentioned that this is just a, a small clarifying amendment, and then we'll move into the, the broader comprehensive update. Next slide, please. So there really are two issues that we're dealing with through this code amendment, both of them addressing height. This first one is addressing the height plane. So I'm gonna flip back and forth between these two slides. Um, but so the NSO uses the height plane concept to measure height. And the question that resulted in recent approvals, just 
standard approvals that were found to be consistent based on how we interpret the code. Um, and also the variance case that went forward is that we realized that there is um, how we've been interpreting the code. Um, there has been a way to sort of move yourself out of the standard, the, the height plane basically in general for the NSO. So if you could go to the next slide, George. Um, so the top of this section is the, the text in black is the definition of the height plane. And if you had the, the, the pleasure of reading that, um, just, you know, on its face, it's confusing. But really, it is sort of this angled idea. And what, in 2005, what the neighborhoods really were concerned about, you were getting, you had a lot of these areas that had one-story structures. And they were trying to soften a new two-story structure and try to work on some compatibility between you know, not saying that we're freezing this area in time, but to allow for some new development, but to soften the distinction between the old and the new. And it really was about, you know, if you're standing, you know, in the middle of the street, making sure that what you see from the street is, is more compatible with the existing resident or the existing homes. And as you go back, you could get some additional height. Um, but, you know, as we've seen in the past, you know, 15, 20 years, we've got a whole new set of building types that have, it's not just the two-story building anymore um, that's being developed. So the height plane was, it means a plane projecting upward and toward the subject lot from a point six feet above grade at the center, so a six-foot person, basically, or your eyeballs are at six feet in the middle of the street. Um, and at the center line of the street, adjacent to the front pub property line, so staring at the, the front property line, um, and extending to the intersection of a vertical plane from the front building line. It's currently written from the front building line with the maximum height established by the neighborhood stabilization overlay and, continue, so, and then continuing on. So the issue was how we define and interpret front building line um, currently in our code. So what we realize is, so front building line has meant minimum front setback. So generally speaking in R75, a lot of these are in R75 areas, you're 20 feet back. Your front setback is 20 feet back. The assumption is, is that that vertical line, the maximum height that's established by the NSO, is established at your front building line, which has basically been the same as where most buildings have put their buildings. Most new buildings have been developed. Well, what we found is when you don't place your building at the front building line or the minimum front setback line, you can push yourself out of the height plane. So, Jorge, if you could go back to, or George, if you could go back to the, yeah. So what you'll see is that on the image to the right, you've got the plane and sort of that sort of surrounding clouded um, circle that is around the angle and then the vertical line. That, that vertical line established the NSO max height at the front building line, which is the minimum setback line. And so as you can see, the building then was pushed back 10 feet, and so it was pushed out of the NSO height plane, and therefore the requirements. And so when you push yourself out of that height plane, then you default to the base zoning height, max height, which is 30 feet to the midpoint. So obviously you can get much higher than, than what is established by the NSO. So we wanted to make sure to clarify that, that it, it was really, for me in particular, it was a head scratcher for a while about, and then we had the, you know, where that was actually measured. And then, you know, we have this image, the image on the left is the image that's in the code as well, in the, NSL co in the NSO code. And you'll see on the bottom it says front build line. Well, it's a little bit confusing because when you think front build line, it's like where I built my structure, but that doesn't match the text. And we have no definition in the code for front build line. So we needed to clarify that. So, George, if you can go to the next slide, please. So what that does is for the, initially what we presented to ZOAC was a change of changing the front building line to front building facade. So regardless of where you put your building, that vertical line gets measured from the front of your building. 
And we also realized that we really needed to, well, and so as part of the conversation with ZOAC, there was a lot of question about, well, what is front building, what does building facade mean? What does front building facade mean? For me, I take it for granted. We don't want to take things for granted, especially in codes. We looked through the code and tried to figure, and like, it's got to be defined somewhere. Well, it's not. Um, in the foreign-based districts, it's talked a lot about in the foreign-based districts, but there actually isn't a definition within the foreign-based districts. So we took that feedback from ZOAC and we determined that we should provide for purposes of this code to not go through and open up the whole entire code right now to define building facade for this code and it means the front facing exterior wall or walls on the first floor of the principal structure on a lot and excludes the building facade of the portion of the principal structure designed or used as the parking structure or a projecting porch. Because that question came up, okay, well, is a porch a front facade? Everywhere I've worked before, no, it is not. A garage, is it a front facade? Everywhere I've worked before, no, it's not. It's really the living area of the building. I mean, if all of that's flush, Together, sure, we could do that. But if you have projections, you don't necessarily want those to be where the vertical, especially if it's a garage, right? So the idea behind adding this into the definition is to avoid the snout garages, you know, the garages that are pushed away up front of the building, using that to establish the vertical line. And we actually got this from, this is the definite, we, Sarah May, who's obviously fantastic when it comes to code, um, did a lot of research and came up with, or researched a lot of surrounding jurisdictions and what their definition of front facade is and other major cities. This is actually akin to the definition in Austin um, for facades. And then we also had to include, for purposes of establishing the vertical plane and NSOs adopted prior to the date of this ordinance, the term building line means building facade. Because again, as the amazing Sarah May found out, that there's also reference in each of the individual NSOs to front building line. So we had to make sure that we were coordinating all of the individual NSO um, ordinances back to the main citywide one. So that is the first issue that we addressed. The, what's in blue, except for facade, is new from ZOAC, that we basically took ZOAC comments and we added in this new text. Um, next slide, please. And these are just some graphics. We also, one of the conditions from ZOAC was that, and I think obviously we need to increase the font on these and make these a little bit easier to read as everybody squints on their screen right now. Um, but it is, you know, trying to label out and be more clear about each of um, what the text is outlining and to graphically represent that through these images. And not only do we have a pitch roof on this, we also have a graphic of a flat roof because that's one of the bigger issues in this as well is the new builds that are coming in are flat roof builds and where are you measuring on a flat, when you have a flat roof circumstance. Um, next slide, please. That's the, the flat roof. And then obviously, you know, in the grade in area, we're showing where, you know, you don't have compliance with the code. We're pushing out to the front of the garage to show that that's not the facade that's established. Um, we also, you know, Arturo del Castillo, who's amazing as well, and, you know, has been able to graphically convert a lot of this text for us. Um, we are, he also has some plan view options that we could consider incorporating into this so you can see it from up above, um, which may provide some clarity, clarity as well. Um, next slide, please. And so there was issue two in this. It wasn't just how we were measuring height. We also, so back in 2005, I don't think this was an issue either. We weren't getting, you know, three-story structures, flat roof structures that then had elevator rooms and parapets on top of them as well, or at least not as regularly and particularly not in these areas that were applying for NSOs. Um, so I don't think it was an issue or that much of a thought to include the exception language that we have in the citywide code to allow um, certain structures to be exempted from our height plane maximums. So those exemptions are also included or allowed within the NSO height plane, and it's become 
at least for those, the neighbors who have elected to have um, height maximums within or height provisions within the NSOs, it has become problematic because you can now get houses that are, you know, 30 plus feet in height or, you know, somewhere around that, but then they can have certain projections of up to 12 feet beyond that. So mechanical rooms, elevator rooms. So it's pretty common now when you're seeing flat roof homes that you also have the elevator or the mechanical room projection that can go 12 feet up. You can also have projected parapets up to four feet beyond the roof, the maximum height. So the recommendation in this one, the issue two was just to, just to strike that that you know, if you wanna do a mechanical room or an elevator room or a parapet or whatever it is, you know, it all has to fall within the height plane maximum. So that is just, if you could go to the next slide, please. So what we're proposing is just to strike the except structures listed in section 51A 4.408A2. Um, and the way it's specifically written this way as the advice of our attorneys that instead of just striking it, we also specifically say if the district regulates height, single family structures, including structures listed in that section, but excluding chimneys, um, because obviously we don't wanna, you know, exclude, ch the tr chimneys can be pretty common for these housing types, so we don't wanna exclude that, may not be built heights that exceed the height plane. So those are the two primary issues, really the only two issues that we're dealing with this code amendment. Um, the first one is specifically just to clarify how it's measured, and then the second one is to address those exemptions that were you know, becoming more common within the NSO. Next slide, please. Um, and so that's the staff recommendation of approval is briefed, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And you do have questions, Commissioner Kingston. Does it make a difference if the parking structure or uh, porch is more than one story? Is more than one story? Mm -hmm. It's, does it say ground floor? Because I, I was thinking, because we normally the, the front facade is just the ground floor. It says first floor, I believe. So it would be measured off the first floor. So regardless of what happens up on the second, I mean, I hope they're not projecting over. Oh God, now you're. <laughs> well, I mean, we use front facade in our conservation district and I've just seen how people manipulate that, so. Mm. Do we, if we think that there's something that could be adjusted to help avoid that, we're happy to, to think about that. Commissioner Carpenter. Yes. <clears throat> I, I, my concern is about the language that's been added since this left ZOAC, because it seems to me we're recreating the very situation we're trying, we were trying to avoid, whereas if you change where building facade is measured in exempt garages and porches, then why couldn't a builder just shove the main structure back and get out of that high, high plane? What am I, what am I, I'm, there's reasons why I'm not an architect. I'm not Be good at, at Because you can't, you, so it'll follow you. That main structure, that's where your vertical line's gonna go. It's not gonna be the projection up front. It's gonna follow you back. So which means it's gonna sh make the angle more and more shallow as you go farther back. But we're still using, I mean, the diagrams show that to determine setback, you're not exempting porches and garages. No, we're just saying that you can't use a porch in a garage to establish the, the vertical line. Okay. I'll, Those cannot be used. I'll have to think about this. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> sure. I'm not good. It at is very technical and very visual, and I, and I see that what you're saying is right, is that, the, that using the garage can artificially set the line, right. and now you're basically taking that option away. Exactly. We're removing that option for those that you could project forward and, and call the front facade. We're removing that from the equation, so it's always gotta be basically, in other words, the living area of the building. Commissioner Hampton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will say I'm one of the folks who asked the question about porches because I've, um, similar to Commissioner Kingston, seen how that variance, um, I think, one of the things I'm trying to get my mind around, I think similar to Commissioner Carpenter, is that there's nothing in here that would prohibit a two-story porch. 
And if the ultimate goal here is to try to address the mass of the of along the streetscape so that there's a consistency, um, again, variation, but that you can't go above that cap. And again, whether it's, you know, something as simple as it cannot violate the height plane. It just seems like there needs to be one other supplemental language. A garage can have a second story on top of it. And so it just seems like it's, the diagrams clearly indicate the intent, but I'm not sure that the language is fully married to that. And I just, did, was that something that staff had evaluated whether that additional clarification might be needed just to reinforce the intent? I think, I mean, we've, yes, we, we, fit, we tried to think about all of those what ifs. Um, again, if you all think that there is some clarifying language given your experience in other districts that would be helpful, we can certainly tighten this up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Turner. What, what is the purpose for, a, why, why use a height plane instead of just using a, a typical uh, height restriction? So I will say that's the direction that we're going to recommend going when we do the bigger amendment. But I think that is that it, that goes beyond just a clarifying amendment, which I think we're going to have to open it up to much, you know, much broader discussion, especially with neighborhoods that may want to in the future have an NSO, those who have height standards right now in the NSO in their existing NSOs. But yeah, the height again, the height plane really was, from what I understand, I obviously wasn't on the team that you know was part of the creation in 2005, but it was. It was about if you're standing in the street, how to soften the transition from, say, the fir the one story to the two story structure. So you potentially still have one story up front, and then you push your massing to the back. Um, I, I, from what I also understand from talking to different residents, they don't under. It's hard to understand the height plane, um, and so really, it should just be a max cap. And ideally, that's the direction that we're going to go in. But that means amending the entire citywide ordinance for, an, or the you know the citywide ordinance for the NSO. And then we'll have to take more detailed consideration for each of the individual NSOs, because you've got the base citywide ordinance, and then you have individual. Um, requirements or regulations for each of those 13 neighborhoods that we would have to do the analysis on. I have one more question. How is the horizontal height plane determined? Is it the average of the four corners to the midpoint of the roof? No, it's just basically standing six, you know, it starts six feet in the middle of the street. No, going not to the point of origin, but the, when, you're, when you're establishing the height mm -hmm. of, the, of that measurement from grade to midline of oh, roof. Oh, that's uh, the standard way that the city but, measures but if there's, height. If there's, what I'm saying is if there is slope to the lot, is it, do you take the average of the four corners? And I would need someone else, to, Sarah might be able to answer that question. It doesn't, it's the same way that it's measured across the city. So however it is that if it's averages or whatever it is, it's the same way that it's measured in the city. Hey, George. Can you go back to that slide that had the definition of height plane? Just that might help us. Okay, it means the plane projecting up and toward the subject from a point six feet above grade of the center line of the street, adjacent to the front property line, extending the intersection of the vertical plane from the front building facade. So it looks like this would be a separate measurement um, that's not related to the grade of the property. Right, but you, ha you have to determine that horizontal height somehow. And when a site has slope, if you measure mm -hmm. from the high point of the slope, that gives you a different horizontal plane when you measure from the low side. The mm -hmm. building department, my understanding is that they take the average of the four corners. It's the highest and lowest. To the, so it's a blended average of it. I was just curious if that is mm -hmm. determined in here. Or yeah. I, I would say it would be separate. So with the NSO, you have to look at the underlying zoning, which is generally R75 or something, maybe R5. And so 
that 30 foot maximum height would be applicable, which they would calculate the highest average of highest lowest corners of the structure. Um, but then they would also have to do a separate calculation where they have this slope that's coming from the street. And so if you have a sure, street, no, I, I, yeah, doing I, that, I get the slope there. I'm just saying in order to do the calculation, you have to determine that horizontal height before you're doing the calcul, you know, the, that's the secondary part, but right. th that's often a point of contention is on okay. a, a site that has topography. How do you determine that? Oh, definitely. It's, it is very complicated. <laughs> Any other questions on this item, commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Herbert. So, it, not to belabor the facade point, but I want to have a clear understanding. If I, the Camelback or the, the the long garage front door thing is the issue in my um, district four mainly, um, you're saying if I decide to push my front door back further than normal, I am now restricted, no matter what, or I can go. If I go back a certain amount, I can go up as high as I want. You can go back as far as you want. You can go anywhere. I mean, if you, you meet the minimum yeah. setback, you can go back as far as you want. It just means that vertical line is going to follow you okay. as far back as you go. Right. Okay. Whereas right now, the vertical line is here at 20 feet, regardless of where you go. So if you keep going back, 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 back now, you move yourself out of the plane. Gotcha. As so, you, you move yourself out of that vertical line. Mm -hmm. So if you move, so the vertical line is going to follow you as far as you push back your front door. Okay, and that stops the ability to not be seen now, or no? It just it it keeps it ensures that you fall within the height plane gotcha. regardless of where you put your building. Understood. And so. It, because if you move yourself out of the height plane, then the height provision doesn't apply for the NSO. And the gotcha. point of having that is. That was my first understanding. Y'all's yeah. questions confuse me. No, I'm just <laughs> no, that's, um, my second question. It's very confusing. Yeah, no, no. The second question is more visual because, um, you know, I'm building a mansion. And if I have a garage now and I want my garage to say go out to my outdoor roof patio. I now have to make that patio a lot shorter not, if I want that. Not necessarily. It all depends on, because it's yeah, generally the NSO is not prohibiting two stories. Gotcha. It's really, this will get you into the, I mean, it depends on what the height provision is in the district. They True. vary. They go anywhere from a 20 foot height limit to a 27 foot height right. limit. Right, but I can't say, oh, I have an elevator shaft here that goes all the way up to this patio area um, because that in, in, in not include that in my Correct. exemption. Okay. Correct. Unless you can figure out how to do all of that within your height plane. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Yes. Which would be the plan, right? That's what we're Correct. doing. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Quick follow-up. Sorry, Commissioner. I'll just to uh, either clear it up a little bit or completely confuse everyone, so we'll give it a shot. Uh, yeah. It, essentially what you're saying in terms of the high plane and that you can you could before move yourself out of the high plane what that means is that by doing that then you can end up building a home that would be higher than what the folks that came up with the NSO were trying to acquire correct correct and and so therefore what you're saying now is that this adjustment will move that high plane and will follow the the living space and therefore limit the height of a home that could, in other words, the, the NSOs were kind of getting gamed a little bit. Correct. Whether, I mean, it could have been totally unintentional, but it, you know, because if you, we all have different lot sizes, right, and different lot lengths, so it could have been completely unintentional. But yeah, we discovered that you could, there is a way to move yourself completely out of the height restriction. Thank you very much. Commissioner Hall. Uh, you gave us a list of 13 NSOs. They all have, most of them have different height restrictions. Some have none. Will these changes impact the existing NSOs or? No, it's not retroactive. So it's just if, if a new development were to come in, then you follow the standard. Just for new builds? New builds, yep. 
Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kingston. Garage placement is one of the characteristics of NSOs. Mm -hmm. So some of these NSOs don't even allow front garages, right? Correct, yeah. <laughs> yes, Commissioner Hampton. Thank you. Um, Skills, I'm just gonna follow up and ask you this in the form of a question. If, within the proposed new language, for the purposes of this subparagraph, building facade means the front facing exterior wall or walls of the first floor of the principal residence, and then you get to um, uh, the building facade or the portion of the principal structure designed or used as a parking structure or a projecting porch subject to compliance with the uh, height plane, would that es essentially reinforce the idea that you can't penetrate it by putting another story, another use? Would that provide it, additional clarity? Because that's what your graphic appears to Yeah, it could, it's certain, yeah, that certainly could. And we that, can we can do a little hashing out of it yeah, afterward. Can, if, if you would have that for um, our public hearing, I would appreciate it. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions, Commissioners? Yes, Thank Commissioner you. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is related to the building line um, conversation. Because my understanding is the building line not the same as the platted building line when creating the subdivision? The front building line is the same as the minimum front setback. Well, because in instances over in District 3, we have scenarios where there's a building line and then there's the setback and those don't match. So is there an area where one would trump the other? Well, I believe that there are certain plans that have, or maybe PDs that have build two lines, and that's different than a front building line. A build two line is a separately established line through a separate process. Specifically for this, and generally in older neighborhoods that are applying NSOs, we're only dealing with the front building line, which is equivalent to the front setback line. So you're saying the build two, there's a build two line and then there's a building line. Correct. And Those are two different flat, things. It's a building line, but then relative to this, it is a build Correct. two line. Um, this is just building well, so line. So my next area of clarification is, is related to that height plane. Um, my understanding is that in a project, the engineer will have to outline what the four corners or what the corners of the first floor building pad is. And then that establishes the first floor elevation. Um, does that coincide with what's happening with this proposed amendment? We don't change that at all. There's no recommendation to have that changed in this amendment. And lastly, um, in the areas where the porch, so the porch can um, exceed itself into the front yard setback. That, and so, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Well, I'm wondering, would that include a porch, patio, garage, or a front balcony? I'm sorry? Could you so repeat the that? areas that can that are not considered front facade? Um, my understanding is that that is included inclusive of a garage and a porch. But I'm wondering, do those definitions also include a front portico or a front facing balcony that will be on the second floor that might have the same overhang and eave as um, the front facade? I think the issue was that porch is another non-defined definition in the code um, or undefined definition in the code. We didn't get into all of those factors and all of the potential what ifs. Uh, oh, here comes Megan Weimer. She's gonna she's gonna clear it all up for us. 
Now, is it on? Now it's on. Hi, Megan um, Weimer. I'm with Planning and Urban Design. Um, I'm going to jump in on this based on how I, th what I think the intent of the question was. So we are not changing through this amendment the front yard setback or the setback of the zoning district. This doesn't allow encroachments into the required setback. This just changes where the slope begins and we're defining facade as that front facing portion of the building at ground level and so on and so forth. But I think it was the question about <laughs> essentially can you encroach into a setback through this amendment? And the answer to that is no. Right, that, that you have clarified. That, that works for me. That's exactly what I was, I was thinking. And, uh, thank you for that clarification. Excellent work. Any other questions on this item, commissioners? Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Gills. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, we will brief uh, item number 11 and have a, a, a quick update on that when we hear it uh, at the hearing. So that concludes the briefing of the Dallas City Plan Commission. It is 11.48 a.m. And uh, enjoy your lunch, commissioners. We'll be back uh, for the hearing at 1230. Sir. Sorry. I found my pen. It's okay. District 1. He's in the back. No, he's here. Oh, he's here. Present. District 2. Present. District three. Present. District four. District Present. four. I see him. District Present. five. Present. District six. Present. District seven. District seven. In the back. He's in the back. District eight. Present. District nine. Oh. District 10. Present. District 11. Present. District 12. District 13. Present. District 14. Here. And place 15. I'm here. Quorum, sir. Thank you very much, Ms. Messina. We do have a quorum. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today is Thursday, October 19th, 1239. Welcome to the Dallas City Plan Commission. A uh, couple of quick announcements before we get started. Uh, the first one is you will find these little yet yellow forms down here at the desk at the bottom right. Uh, we do really need a record of your visit with us here today. So at some point today, please.